Yes. Um, I wanted to ask a question. This is a serious question. It, um, it may come off a bit offensive to you. It's not, it's not intended to be offensive anyways, but you'd spoken a lot about fairness and so forth, but um, I wanted to know why judges, prosecutors uh, bestow upon themselves immunity. Isn't that inherently unfair? And as it, it's my understanding, it's not the will of the people, but judges have made rulings favoring themselves for being immune from any type of prosecution. Thank you. Well, I, I think the answer is, and this reflects my somewhat dated recollection of, of when I was studying this subject as a law student, because I don't think I've had a case as a judge that involves judicial immunity and perhaps even prosecutorial immunity. But I think the rationale is that you need to insulate those people from lawsuits based on their official decision making, because otherwise their decisions will be skewed undesirably in a way to avoid the prospect of litigation. Now, you can debate that as a policy issue uh, different ways. I just want to follow up. I'm talking about cases where it's implicit. Like, for example, um, a person's clearly innocent, and uh, I think there's a case where Harry Connick Jr.'s father was an attorney, and he withheld exculpatory evidence to a person who was on death row, and that person was on death row for like 30 years, and then this prosecutor could not be prosecuted. And my main point is this is not this, pro all these immunities that you guys are bestowing upon yourselves, it's not the will of the people. The people, I mean, as I understand it, I haven't polled anybody, but the people clearly don't will that judges and prosecutors who are malicious um, be immune from any type of prosecution. It's judicial ruling. So. That would be kind of a conflict well, of interest, wouldn't it? it's not just it? judicial rulings. What you're talking about in the Connick case, I think, is grounded in a federal court interpretation of what immunities exist relative to Section 1983 actions. And uh, some of it is a matter of common law. Some of it, uh, in other contexts, is statutory. Arizona has various immunity statutes that apply to various public figures. So it, it's not something that is insulated from the legislature expanding or contracting. So it, it's not just something judges untethered are making up without constraints from the public. If the public thought that those immunities should be narrowed, I think both as a federal matter and as a state matter, they could do that legislatively. My name is Mark Stevens. I host a radio show here in the Valley called the No State Project. A qu couple of questions going to the nature of, uh, of the government that, that you are a part of. And I know that all governments, and I've had this confirmed by the Attorney General and other judges and prosecutors, that the argument is that if I am physically in Arizona, then the Constitution and laws of the government of Arizona apply to me, and you as the government would have jurisdiction over me. My question for you is, do you have any actual facts that would actually prove that that argument is true? <laughs> um, That's funny. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure I understand the question, and I'm not sure that your proposition of what the legal principle is as, is, is correct. I'm, because I just I'm not sure I heard you correctly. If you're asking, is it in fact true that if you're physically in Arizona, you're subject to the, this state? I, th I think that's right. Yes, and my question to you is that that's your argument, and that's what prosecutors and police officers are throwing peaceful people in prison for every day. If cops go out on the street, they see you, they feel, oh, he's physically here, our laws apply, we're going to go and investigate. My question for you is, do you have any actual proof, any empirical evidence, facts, to support that argument? Yes, because people who are physically here and violate our laws are, in fact, prosecuted and incarcerated. Uh, well, that's what Bill Montgomery said. That's called uh, an argument. Well, let me finish. That's called an argumentum ad baculum. That's not support for your argument. Just because you're physically well, you asked willing... me if I had facts to support the argument. So an argument ad factum is quite appropriate. Well, he didn't answer the question. Okay, well, one, I had another question. That's... Just got, no, I got one. No, he didn't allow, he didn't expand on the, on the answer. Of course, uh, this is just a general question. Um, what are your thoughts on sentencing guidelines in this topic? Um, how, I'm just, uh, your thoughts. 
hmm. Um, I can't give you a very informed answer because when you said sentencing guidelines, I immediately thought of the federal sentencing guidelines. And, and that's something that I have not had contact with for more than 15 years. I mean, I, I worked with them when I was assistant U.S. attorney, but I'm not since. The person you ought to ask about that is John Sands, the federal defender for Arizona.